in the north of Scotland lies a magical landscape. This is the flow country. People have lived here for thousands of years. Alongside some of Europe's most important wildlife. Although much of the landscape looks as it did millennia ago, some areas have been damaged and now need to be restored. Not just for wildlife, but for people and our planet itself. It all started 10,000 years ago. Britain's climate started to warm. Producing dramatic landscape changes as the glaciers across Scotland started to melt. Huge quantities of meltwater poured across the landscape. The cool, wet climate that followed created a giant blanket bog in what is now Caithness and Sutherland. This became the flows. A huge wetland of bogs, lochs and pools. Covering over 200,000 hectares of land, the flow country is the largest blanket bog in Europe. I love the flows. They're a vast and beautiful landscape. They're a place where you can come and just realise just how small we are as people. The flow country is the heart that is pumping water of huge quality. So good order in the flow country, good order in the peatlands, good water, good fishing population. I suppose I have a connection to the land because my family have been here for generations. It's important ecologically. It's very important to me because I make my living from it. Below the surface of this giant bog is the flow's greatest treasure. And the UK's most important resource in the fight against global climate change. Peat has been accumulating over thousands of years trapping over 400 million tonnes of carbon. More than twice that stored in all the forests in the UK. Peatlands are more efficient at storing carbon than rainforests. All because of this small moss. Sphagnum mosses are specially adapted to grow in these waterlogged acidic soils. Because of these conditions, the mosses don't fully decay when they die. The dead remains pile up and are pressed together, eventually turning into peat. The carbon within the layers of peat is then locked away below the ground. That's why healthy peatlands are so effective at capturing carbon. In fact, they're one of the most important carbon stores on the planet. Roxanne Anderson is a peatland scientist studying the carbon beneath the surface. It's really difficult to see when we just stand on it but if you start digging and seeing how dense the carbon is underneath us it is it's really staggering the amount of carbon that's just stored in the peatland just because of these little plants. Sphagnum moss creates a unique habitat for the plant and animal species that live here. Anna Gemmett of RSPB Scotland is an expert on the flow country's wildlife. 
Because the sphagnum creates its own habitat, they make it very acidic, they hold a lot of water. It means a lot of species can't live here, so anything that can live here is really specially adapted to living in what is really quite a harsh environment. This landscape attracts some of the UK's rarest wildlife. Hen harrier. Common scoter and two species of diver. Red deer roam the open moorland. And even the plants are adapted to living life on the edge. This sundew has a sinister side. Its sticky sap attracts insects, gluing them to the leaves. The leaf then curls round the insect, slowly digesting it and absorbing the nutrients it needs to survive. The pool systems contain a strange and alien-like world. Palmate newts jostle for space amongst the plants. Caddisfly larvae use silk to weave aquatic vegetation into protective cases. You're also getting the great diving beetles, which are, are the, the tigers of the pool system. They're huge, great beetles that can even predate on newts, so that's something really exciting. And there's the dragonfly larvae. Uh, dragonflies spend most of their lives as larvae under the water. They're just a hunting machine, so they've got probably the best eyes in the insect kingdom. They can see above, below, backwards and forwards all at the same time. And with that, they've got the two sets of wings that can move independently so they can hover, they can again fly up and down, forward and backwards. But much of this incredible place was almost lost. For many, many years, people didn't really see the value of peatland. They thought of peatland as wastelands because they weren't very productive. You can't grow stuff on them, you can't have anything on them. So the only way to get them more productive was to start draining them and maybe try planting things on them. So the drainage was done, for example, to help having more sheep on the hills, and the drainage was also done to start planting the trees. All those forests that we see behind us are actually plantation that were done uh, in between the 60s and, and the 80s, really. So there was a really fast uh, movement of trying to plant as many trees as possible in the flow country. Despite being treeless for over 4,000 years, large areas of the flow country were damaged through agricultural drainage and commercial conifer cultivation. These forests store less carbon than the blanket bog, and in many places, their planting damaged this fragile habitat, causing the bog to dry and crack, releasing its precious carbon. Specialist bird and plant species could no longer survive here as the forest replaced the bog. The future of the flow country looked uncertain. More recently, there's been a recognition that the peatland store a huge amount of carbon. But when you disturb them, this carbon is being released to the atmosphere at a much faster pace than it's been accumulating and fueling global climate change. Conservationists campaigned to save the peatlands. Finally, their efforts paid off.
Large areas of the flows were protected under national and European legislation. And in 1995, the RSPB acquired the Forsenard estate, and in later years, its surrounding areas, to create the largest RSPB nature reserve in the UK. Restoration work began, involving RSPB Scotland, private landowners and public bodies. And in 2006, the Peatlands Partnership was formed, bringing together a group of organisations to secure the future of the flow country. Essentially, the restoration process is simply to bring back an open landscape for the biodiversity that the peatlands are so important for, where the water table can rise again and so that the key species like sphagnum can come back again. To achieve this, tree plantations needed to be cleared. Many were of poor quality due to the harsh growing conditions on deep peat. This male is performing a sky dance to attract the female. Hen harriers are still heavily persecuted in Britain. Restoring the flows provides a sanctuary for them. There is a more positive story of humans in the flow country. People have used the land here for thousands of years. Evidence of ancient people is scattered across the flows. The Camster Cairns, a group of 5,000-year-old Neolithic burial chambers are amongst the oldest stone monuments in Scotland. Today, the land is just as important to the people who live here. And Pete is part of that story. For centuries, local people have cut the peat into slabs and stacked it to dry in the open. These slabs are then burned to keep houses warm over the cold winter months. The Great Blanket Bog is the beating heart that provides life for the rivers and wildlife. 
and its health determines the quality of water that flows into the rivers. With declining salmon stocks across Scotland, it's never been so important to manage these rivers. Fishing is an important part of the local economy here, and organisations are working hard to make fishing practices more sustainable. John Thurso is the chairman of the Caithness District Salmon Fishery Board and works to regulate fishing on these rivers. What we try to do on the Caithness Board is to preserve and protect the resource that we are charged with. So that basically means salmon, ensuring that there are uh, good growth of juveniles in the river, ensuring that we do the best environmental practices. Alan Youngson and his team are electrofishing small rivers in the flow country. Checking the health and numbers of juvenile fish that live here. Electric pulses stun the small fry, who are then caught and measured before being released. Alan and his team have been electrofishing at specified sites to find out what fish are in there, what juvenile fish, which is called the biomass. And by looking at the biomass of the river at those sites, we have been able to find out things that we simply didn't know before. And we've been able to gather data and information about the salmon biomass in the river. By finding out how many little baby fry or slightly bigger par there are on any given year and following that through three years, you have an idea irrespective of how many are being caught of what is there. And that helps you both in the overall management, but also to know what is a sustainable catch. Red deer are also managed in the flow country. With no natural predators, high deer numbers can damage the delicate flow's habitat. So keeping them at sustainable levels meets the interests of private estates and conservation groups. And like fishing, deer stalking brings visitors to the flows and helps generate important revenue for the local economy. Communities are also benefiting from carefully managed peatlands, helping support traditional livelihoods like cattle and sheep farming. Alan Mackay is a farm manager in the Kyle of Tongue. I suppose I have a connection to the, to the land because my, my family have been here for generations, it's maybe for 100 years past, it may have been overgrazed. Now, it's not overgrazed, we, we, graze, we manage it. We have to be very careful how we graze it. You don't want to damage the peatland, so you tend to try and keep the sheep to the harder ground. We get the golden plover come in here early in the spring, and they're on it as well picking up insect life, with the sheep being in about there. This landscape attracts important numbers of wading birds. Peatland lochs are home to two of the most enigmatic bird species in the flows.
Diver is one of the UK's rarest birds. When they return for the breeding season, they nest close to the water's edge, on large lochs. But with variable water levels, their nests can be prone to flooding. So conservationists have created artificial floating islands for the birds to breed on. These rise and fall with the water levels. It's been a huge success. People are working hard to understand how the restoration process is impacting the flow country. Roxanne and her colleagues from across the UK are studying the carbon stocks and the greenhouse gas exchanges in these peatlands. As scientists, we need to have data. We need to measure these, these processes to make sure that we know what's happening, how fast it's happening. And so one of the projects that we've been doing here has been to try and understand how quickly these restored peatlands stop emitting carbon. New scientific instruments, like this flux tower, monitor the health of the bog. What you can see just behind me is one of the many ways that we use to measure the carbon that's coming in or out of the peatland and we're measuring how much carbon is actually emitted by those disturbed peatlands, so the forested peatlands or the drained peatlands. And we also have a good idea of how much carbon is captured by the healthy peatlands, so we're also measuring that. And then we're also measuring the different stages of restoration to see what exactly the carbon is doing in these peatlands. So is it coming out of the peatland or is it coming back into the peatland like it does in a natural system? It will take years before the flows can truly recover. But real progress is being made. Public engagement plays an important role in protecting this fragile peatland ecosystem. Every year, Visitors come to explore, enjoy and learn about the flow country. The Flows Lookout has been built on RSPB's Forsenard Flows National Nature Reserve by the Peatlands Partnership. It gives people a unique perspective on the landscape and its pool systems. With so much to see and do, the flows offer visitors a unique experience of nature like nowhere else in the UK. Organisations are working together within the Peatlands Partnership to take the flows to the future. Protecting the environment, supporting communities, and building a better future for our children. The core thing in all of it is to actually make sure that in all we do, we do it with the grain of nature and in harmony with nature. This absolutely magical, world-class blanket bog actually can be maintained and sustained and even some regenerated. There's something really special about the flow country. You can either be slightly overwhelmed by how huge it is or also look really closely at how beautiful it is in a small way. And of course the peatlands are a key element of this landscape and, and for me they are beautiful. They change with the light, they change with the season, but every time I come in the peatland it's a very peaceful environment for me. Uh, I just love the landscapes here. If we can help protect and restore the peatlands, they'll continue to be a wildlife haven and an important carbon store 
in the fight against climate change.